Put your, your microphones and your screens as well, because otherwise the, the screen will change. Um, so again, please, when anyone has entered new, please mute your microphones. I hope everyone hears me okay, and if not, please address my colleague Enrique through the chat box. So now I'm going to start with the scientific webinar, the first one, which is the title of Woman in STEM. As my colleague um, said, uh, my name is Marina Jimenez, and as you might know, I also work for the Project Scientix. And if you're here, it means that you're willing me, if you're willing to hear me talk about about 45 minutes about the role of women in STEM. And I want to start this presentation by telling you a little bit of a story, and the story is about why I decided to run this webinar. So about eight months ago, I had the opportunity to prepare a workshop for heads of school here in the European School Net headquarters with the topic of gender and STEM education. And for that reason, I had prepared an initial activity where I had asked participants to simply draw a scientist. This activity was based in an experiment that was carried out in 1957 when two anthropologists did a nationwide study in the U.S. to examine, to examine how 35,000 high school students from different backgrounds viewed a scientist. The result was that the most popular image drawn were, was a man characterized with glasses, with white hair, white beard, wearing a white lab coat, just like the one that you can see here in the PowerPoint version. And although this research took place nearly 60 years ago, during my workshop about eight months ago, I had the exact same result. Out of 25 participants, only one of them drew anything different from a white man in a white coat. And what struck me the most was that even though there was about 14 women in the room, only one of them drew a woman. And I was wondering, how could this be? Some of these women had studied themselves STEM subjects, but when asked to draw a scientist, they would still draw a man. Now, doing a little bit more of research, um, sorry, uh, I found out, doing, doing a little bit more of research, I found out that a different experiment was carried out in 1983, also in the US, where different scientists were invited to present in schools. So students were again asked to draw a scientist before and after the visit of the scientist. The data revealed that after the visit, the visit of first in the first place a man who was a scientist, many of the stereotypic characteristics disappeared. So they would, they would draw a more realistic version of a scientist without the white coat, without the glasses, without the crazy hair. And when the second visit happened, which was the visit of a female scientist, a lot more people drew a woman, and especially a lot of young girls. So they concluded that by exposing young girls to female scientists in primary school classrooms, it could have a positive influence in their perception of careers for women in the science and engineering fields. So after reading about those experiments, I decided that I wanted to carry on trainings or activities where I could expose the importance of gender awareness and try to understand in which way we could empower women to engage in science careers by doing simple things, just like inviting a female scientist in a school. So in that regard, I want to start this webinar with a historical perspective on the role of women throughout history. In fact, women have been contributing to the development of scientific knowledge since ancient times, but have often, if not always, had to work against biases and have also often been excluded from educational and intellectual cycles. So I want to start by mentioning some of the most notable, notable scientists uh, of all times. One of them was Ada Lovelace. She was considered, and she is considered still today, the mother of all computer nerds, and is widely regarded as the world's first computer programmer. It was thanks to her mother, who introduced her to mathematics when she was a kid, that she first became acquainted with the subject. In fact, it was her mother who, as a way of fighting against what she thought it was the insanity of her father, who was the famous poet Lord Byron, she introduced her to mathematics. In, in the end, Ada, she came to be regarded as the world's first computer programmer. And even though no functioning computers were built throughout her life, she continuously worked on a general purpose computer called the analytical engine. And she anticipated the future ability of computers to go beyond mere calculation. 
Ada, she described how the analytical engine was capable of computing general information and emphasized its ability to be programmed. In fact, in recognition of her position as the godmother of software programming, the Ada high-level computer language was named after her. The second person that I want to talk about is the very famous Marie Curie. She's actually, her full name is Marie Curie Slodowska, as she is from Polish origin. And she is indeed one of the most iconic scientists of all time. Marie, she discovered two new elements, polonium and radium. She demonstrated that radioactivity is a, product, is a property of atoms and promoted the use of radiation to treat cancer. She was the first woman professor at the University of Paris. She was among the first scientists to realize the importance of quantum theory and the first person to win not one, but two Nobel Prizes. So it is really funny to see how, while she did most of her research in radioactivity in collaboration with her husband, Pierre Curie, and, she, and based on original findings of another scientist called Henry Becquerel, the only those two last scientists were originally nominated for the Nobel Prize. Eventually, Pierre, her husband, he made it clear that he would not accept the prize if Marie was not to be included. And finally, the three were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics for their work in radiation. And in fact, Marie's ownership of her ideas, it is unquestionable because her original findings were very well documented and she published all of her discoveries uh, eventually. Nevertheless, she did struggle throughout her whole career against many accusations that her work would not, would not just her work, but it was her husband's. Now, even though I have talked about these two ladies, um, who are probably two of the most well-known female scientists, there has been many, many others that have been overlooked in history. Over the centuries, uh, female researchers have had to work as volunteer faculty members, and they have not been creditor, credited by, for some major discoveries. And this credit has been automatically assigned to other male colleagues, and even sometimes just ignored in textbooks. So a couple of examples are two other women. I'm going to talk first about Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Jocelyn discovered pulsars, pulsars, which are the remnants of massive stars that went supernova. And she did it while analyzing data that she printed out on paper from a radio telescope that she helped assemble. Well, this finding resulted in another Nobel Prize in physics, but the, the Nobel Prize, it did not go to her. It went to her colleague, Anthony Hewish, her colleague and supervisor, and to another, to another radio astronomer who worked with her at the Cambridge University. Another woman who suffered from the same treatment was, was Rosalind Franklin. Should I stop? Sorry for the interruption with the sound. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to talk about Rosalind Franklin, who was working on determining the structure of DNA, which she actually did by using X-rays to take a picture of a DNA molecule. Indeed, Franklin's image of the DNA molecule was key to decode its structure, but only other researchers, in fact male researchers, called Watson, Kirk, and Wilkins, received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their work. And in fact, Rosalind was often portrayed as just an assistant rather than the head of her own department, sorry, of her own project, which is what she was. Oops. Oh, I want to go one back. Sorry, yeah. Whoops. Yes. So this has been some historical portrayal, portrayal of women in science. And these are just some, some cases that have helped us exemplify the bias against female scientists. But I don't want to talk only about with anecdotal material. This bias situation has been going on and it's pretty generalized. And women have always been subject to a patriarchal structure that would confine them to the household or the dependence of a male counterpart, whether that was a father, a brother, or a husband, and never with own resources or with a societal structure that would enable them to fulfill their potential or just to decide by themselves. In fact, 
We have been living in a society where women, in order, in order to be recognized scientists or even to aspire to acquire a scientific career, they have had to deliberately, deliberately be overqualified, while men have been able to have direct access to it regardless of their qualification or intellect. So what about nowadays? Uh, sure, we've done a lot of progress, but it can be proved that the virus is still very much present. A, lit, a little bit less overt, but it has definitely not gone away. And in that regard, I want to show some data. So, nowadays we can still prove that women are underrepresented in, in science as a whole. There's even a term coined in that regard, it's called the gender gap. You can see it on the map, especially in senior positions. And we, as we can see in the screen, the levels of women as a share of total researchers uh, in, in, in STEM is clearly underrepresented for every region worldwide. See the amount of blue on the map. And even some of the latest UNESCO data shows that, uh, for instance, in North America and Western Europe, the average representation for women in research is only of 32%, with the lowest average found in, sorry if there's anyone from the Netherlands, but it is in the Netherlands with a 24%. Um, nevertheless, I am quite happy to say that the situation is a little bit different in Eastern Europe. Um, in Central and Eastern Europe, where the overall average rises up for to 40%, and if you look at the little arrows, I have highlighted the situations of Croatia, Bulgaria, and Romania, which I think there might be some uh, audience from those countries. So uh, the, the levels of people of women in R&D in these countries are like quite better. I have to say that. But nevertheless. Um, the percentages of women enrolled in science education programs declines from bachelor to undergraduate or graduate degrees, and as well in further research programs. And this disparity is even more dramatic, or on the contrary, it can even disappear when we narrow down the, fo the focus to particular fields. So let's moving on to the next graph. I want to show you some more data. Oh my God! Let's go. Yes, one down. This one. So I want to take a look at what young women nowadays choose to study. This first example is a picture where we can see the male um, and female graduates in math and science in Europe in its data for 2012, so it's pretty recent. And the pictures show that the darker the color, the higher percentage of graduates. Now the map in blue is for men or boys, and the map in purple is for girls. And I, see, I think we can see the difference pretty clear. Now another example is this next graph. Let's see if the part one works. Yes. In this other picture, we can see the field of study chosen for women represented in the percentage of qualifications awarded to women in tertiary education or advanced programs. This is data from 2000 and until 2012. And if you take a, a look at the blue arrows, arrows first, health and welfare and life sciences are some of the areas preferred by women, whereas engineering, manufacturing, and construction are among the least preferred alongside computing. So basically, what these graphs tell us are that we st we're lacking female STEM professionals worldwide, and we're lacking on STEM graduates, especially in regard to certain STEM degrees. Um, mostly concerned with mathematics or with uh, computing or with engineering. So why is this? Why do, she, why do girls choose a particular for, uh, field? So let's move to, yes. So I doubt there is any genetic predisposition to choose one or another degree. So my first thought was to look at some social indicators. And I did find several studies that pointed out towards uh, very interesting indicators. So of course, I'm not going to deny any intrinsic and genuine personal interest of any individual. Um, but this is going to be, of course, conditioned by other very important factors, like the ones uh, written here, which are, first of all, our perception of our, of our own abilities and societal expectations. So the first one, this one is perception of our own abilities. This here, I'm referring to the fact that uh, if, uh, students, if they don't believe that they have the ability to master new ideas, new problems, they might, they might not persevere in trying to understand 
difficult concepts or subjects that they might consider too difficult. And if there's any science uh, teachers in the audience, in the in the in the audience, um, I, they will agree with me that sciences are, are often regarded by teenagers as difficult science subjects. Uh, so many studies have concluded that girls, especially when they reach the teenager years, they tend to do drop considerable in their levels of self-esteem and in perceiving themselves as gifted enough or capable enough um, to uh, attain uh, certain degrees or certain subjects. So this one is the first condition that I wanted to mention. And the second one are societal perceptions and ex expectations, as well as the perceived image and role of men and women in society. So still up to this point, in some occasions, men are still perceived with certain qualities, such as knowledgeable, secure, leadership, uh, having a technical brain, while women are still perceived with object adjectives such as emotional or, or caring. And I'm sure we all agree that these are all stereotypes. But even though they still are stereotypes, they do end up affecting our social environment and our social perceptions of ourselves and of the other ones. So in that regard, I know I've only wanted to talk about STEM education, but I'm going to make a parenthesis and also want to talk about STEM jobs because these also affect to um, women engaging in science careers. So in fact, as I said, gender prejudices can be the cause why women are more likely to work, for instance, in, jo in jobs such as healthcare occupations that, rather than in research or in business enterprises because men are still associated with leadership positions and women are still commonly regarded as main caregivers. Even some psychological studies have shown that there's negative prejudices towards hiring women in STEM research careers. And this is understood as hidden cultural influences. For instance, some studies showed that not being used to see a woman in a STEM occupation could form um, a psychological vision where this, the, the terms uh, woman and, and the science would not be associated together and then you would create, create a ne negative bias in your mind with your, with your first intention would not be to hire a woman for the position. So in fact, I wanted to, um, let's say not prove because this of course is not going to be a proof, but I wanted to see if by a, a quick Google search I could find some stereotypes between men and women on the internet. And I was quite surprised that I found this pretty quickly. In fact, uh, I did this this morning. I wanted to add it to the webinar. I went online and I typed first engineer. And the first result that I got was what you're seeing on the screen. is a bunch of men. There's no woman. So the first image that we have of engineers are just men. And then I, got, I gathered some other examples. For instance, in the first uh, picture, in the one on the top, I typed teacher. And then the second one, I typed professor. So, professor. so um, in English, um, teacher is mostly regarded as a primary school teacher, and professor is mostly a university professor. So a person um, with a higher, let's say, like a higher degree. So it was very interesting for me to say how the, lead, the, the, the positions that were considered as skill leader of leadership were still regarded as men position and not woman position. And the last screenshot that I'm going to show you, which is the more um, STEM related maybe, is when I typed nurse and when I typed doctor, I think I typed doctor. Um, doctor, which is um, a more specific profession, while nurse is a more uh, not, 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 not so open profession, it's still characterized by doctors being men and women being nurse. So as a quick search, I could, I could actually find all those stereotypes that I've been talking about on the internet, as simple as that. So yeah, that was quite interesting for me uh, to see. So then I wanted to go on and see how could we solve this situation. Well, before I talk about specific actions that we can apply, for instance, in the classroom, as I'm aware that most of the audience here are teacher, I want to talk about a theoretical concept that I think is pretty important, and that is the dichotomy between gender equality and gender equity. So here I'm going to put the definitions. Here we have. 
gender equality, this is defined as meaning equality between men and women, of course. It entails the concept that both men and women are free to develop their personal abilities and make choices with the limitations, sorry, without the limitations set by stereotypes, rigid gender roles, and prejudices. So fair enough, I guess we all agree in that. But then what is it that it's gender equity? So gender equity means fairness of treatment for women and men according to their respective needs. And I'm going to emphasize that you notice the words fairness and needs. So gender equity includes equal treatment or sometimes a differential treatment that which is considered equivalent in terms of rights, benefits, obligations, and opportunities. And I wanted I know it might be a little bit tricky to understand this concept, so I wanted to show this little picture that I drew myself. Um, the picture on the, the sorry, the, the left, it's gender equality, it represents gender equality, and the picture on the right represents gender equity. So you see, if you see it quickly, we have three little people here, and the three are of different sizes. So if you give the same box to the three little people, in the end, there's still only going to be one who reaches the apple. But if you give them different sizes boxes, the, the three of them, they will be able to reach the apple. So what I'm trying to say here is that if a person starts from a less advantaged position, in this case, if a girl is coming from a less advantaged position, we need to give her more advantages. We need to give her a bigger box so she can also reach the apple. So this was the theoretical framework that I wanted to um, show because I know sometimes there's some little controversy about programs who are specifically addressed to uh, girls and not just boys and girls. So I wanted to explain a little bit the rationale between these programs so people would understand why they are specifically addressed to women. So I saw some comments about my uh, drawing. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. And um, so finally, I wanted to finish by giving specific ideas that you could apply in the classroom if you're a teacher, in your school, if you're a head of school, or even if you're everyday life with your daughters, with everyone. So first of all, I think it's important to boost the curiosity around the world to girls when they're still little girls and allow them to explore and discover it by themselves, make them comprehend the scientists take place around them and that STEM subjects are skills that they can have relevant applications in their everyday lives. I also think it is very important to boost confidence, as I've said, that's something that declines in girls, especially in their teenage years. So we need to raise confident girls with initiative, with hard uh, work ethic, and allow them to embrace their knowledge and their abilities, and in a way that it will help them overcome any obstacles that they might encounter along the way to become successful scientists or successful professionals. And another one, another thing that I really want to emphasize is to introduce them to, to role models and to mentors who can offer guidance. As I've said in the beginning of my presentation, it is important to have female role models because then girls, they can see themselves reflected in those women. And uh, yes, they, they can, it can make um, girls stop feeling as outsiders in STEM fields, and it can also offer some academic guidance and teach them about the full range of career possibilities that they could, uh, that they could have access to. And then about some specific things that you can do as a teacher. Um, for instance, when you're writing a text, make sure that it's relevant to both genders, so ensure that boys and girls are equally interested. Also, um, make sure that you address boys and girls in the same way and in the same number. Um, there's been some studies, I read about some studies, in which in, in, in high schools it was pretty common to see boys participating a lot more in class than girls because of what I've said that um, uh, girls uh, drop on the race of self-esteem and of confidence. So it's important to address in an equal way boys and girls. So address maybe um, if you want to ask some questions, do it first to a boy, then to a girl, then to a boy, then to a girl. Then also encourage both genders, trying to encourage also girls even though they don't participate actively in class. Then, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> then also um, provide students with prescriptive informational feedback on their performance and 
because this is important for their beliefs in their abilities. Um, it's important to give back um, projects, exams, with very detailed qualifications because what girls or boys might think in their head, it might be a personal perception of their abilities. If we offer them a, an objective assessment of the project they've done, of the exam they've done, with a very detailed qualification, they will be able to see objectively their results and their outcomes, and it will not be such a subjective way of seeing themselves. So in that sense, uh, clarity in grading, policy, uh, in grading policies, so how do you grade the different uh, res uh, exams or projects, that is very important. And also I think it's important to address um, any, any inequities that take place in, in the classroom. If, you, if there's any um, stereotypical comments or any sexist remarks by any student, by any other teacher, I think it's important to address this because then it creates an atmosphere of gender awareness in the classroom. Also, it might be good to analyze some learning content and resources on gender awareness. I think it's important to educate not just, uh, not just girls, but also boys on the topic. It's a topic of everyone. And um, yes, also vary the working methods. And when you're having students working in groups, um, and some studies, um, they've said also that um, boys tend to take the leadership positions and girls take to tend to take more administrative tasks. So make sure you change the roles in groups and you sometimes make girls uh, to take the leadership positions so they all change their roles and they can see themselves in different situations. And of course, give equal attention to boys and girls and encourage everyone to participate in STEM activities. And as far as it concerns to me, um, I think I've given some advice to teachers to engage in some gender awareness activities in the classroom. And I wanted to ask you now if you had, well, first of all, thanks a lot for caring with us in this webinar. And I wanted to ask you if you have any tips that you've applied in your classroom, if you have experienced any sexist behavior, if you agree with what I've shared, if you disagree. I want to see if there's some discussion here and I want to see if there's anyone who has any opinion in the topic. So I'm going to look at the chat. Someone is mentioning um, about Nobel Prize. Uh, Julia said, uh, she says that she would uh, stress hands-on activities because boys and girls have different learning styles. That's absolutely true. That's what I was saying, that you, we need to um, make everyone choose different roles in the classroom when they are developing kinds of projects. I think it's important to change the leadership positions between boys and girls and address them in an, in an equal way, make them all participate. I don't know if there's any other question. Let me see on the chat. Um, if I can interrupt, interrupt you a little bit, Marina, I'm not sure if you can hear me. <laughs> I can uh, hear you. Constantina, <laughs> uh, for instance, mentioned that um, uh, on a governmental level, right, they are promoted uh, gender equality and gender equity between uh, uh, in STEM education. How, because in most of your presentation, you have actually discussed about what teachers can do. How important mm -hmm. do you think that um, at teachers, how important do you think it is for teachers to receive this support, maybe uh, from the government, from... Uh... Yeah, well, I think it's important from the government to, first of all, support any initiatives that the, the teachers might have. Of course, teachers, they cannot work alone. Uh, we know it here from Scientix. We receive public, that Scientix is a publicly funded um, project. So we do receive uh, funding from government, and specifically from the European government, and we work with teachers. And some of our teachers, they are promoting gender awareness, and this would not be possible if we do not have a funding from a government. And of course, if we do not have a general strategy backing us up to promote gender equality from the government, and I'm sure in many, in many European countries nowadays, we 
there are strategies promoted uh, by the governmental initiatives uh, to help um, in this regard and to improve in this regard. So, of course, it's, it's really, really important. I think it's not a question of a specific group of people, of a specific stakeholder in this regard, teachers, that they should work on it. I think it's, it's, a, it's a job but that we should all do together, pretty much. Yes, agreed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Is there any other question, any other topic? Someone is saying here that a Google research always casts a right light on our understanding. Oh, thanks for that. I actually made sure when I Googled the Im images that I showed before it that I had deleted my history on Google so there were nothing influencing the results because I'm aware of uh, Google bubbles that they feel to produce your results so I try to make it as impartial as possible. Uh, we have also some examples of um, Europe, other European projects that, um, that uh, focus on the promotion of STEM for girls. Uh, we have a comment from Lauren in the chat. Uh, for, she's mentioning in, ingenious, maybe? I can't see it. Responsible research and innovation. Responsible research and innovation. That's true. We do have some European projects um, supporting the role of girls. I'm also aware, I know ingenious is already finished, but uh, I, I think there's some people in the audience that did participate in that project and they did some communities of practice on a woman, uh, on gender in STEM. There's many, many projects who are addressing the topic because it's not a single issue, it's a trans transversal issue, so a lot of topics can integrate it in their everyday activities, so it's not an isolated issue. So I'm pretty sure there's many projects that, that include it, and if not, and you are participating in any of the projects, you could actually maybe ask for it, ask to include it in your in your projects, I'm also aware that um, e-twinning is a very, very big project. I'm sure you all know it. We also have some things on gender. Uh, Lauren is mentioning archive inquiry. Archive uh, inquiry as well. Someone is saying, how lucky we are, Romanian woman. Uh, yes, indeed you are. <laughs> You have uh, one of the most uh, equal statistics when it comes to women uh, working in STEM education. Someone is also mentioning the fact uh, from Milena, she says, in primary schools in Serbia, the achievement in STEM subjects are mostly from girls, and afterwards in high schools, that is changed for some reason. This is very interesting to say because it's actually, it, uh, it, it goes in pair to what I've said about the levels uh, dropping for self-esteem, for um, prejudices from stereotypes, from the, the role of men and women in society. That all peaks when girls and boys reach high school, that's when all these um, stereotypes they come to play, and that's one of the reasons why girls might perform a little bit lower on 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 high school. Although I'm not, I wouldn't, I'm not sure about the the scores of boys and girls in STEM education in high school. So I don't want to say anything in particular because I don't have any data right now with me. But I thought it was interesting. Um, someone is. Uh, Asking to send the presentation, we will do that, so don't worry, we will share the presentation. Um, and then someone is saying, uh, I'm also noticed the change probably models from media are different and influence them more. Yes, uh, that is also a very important topic because, of course, we're not isolated people. We are all together in a society, so it's very important to have portrayed in media and in social culture and in pop culture the appropriate images of women. It's, for instance, it all starts when we're really young and we see in kids' catalogs and every time there's a truck, the truck is with a little boy and not a little girl. Well, we should start developing kids' catalogs um, for their toys where they're little girls playing with trucks and little boys playing with something that might be considered girly. So that's a way 
of educating and that's a way to open uh, every child's mind to all the opportunities they have. And so they can actually choose by themselves what they want to become and if they want to become scientists or engineer, allow them since a very early age. Um, I don't know, Alina, if you want to? Well, uh, we can wait a little bit if, uh, if the participants have uh, any other questions. We can mm -hmm. wait for five minutes. But yeah. uh, in the meantime, uh, thank you very much for your very interesting and very engaging presentations. Uh, I really like the fact that uh, the chat has been so active, particularly in the second half of the presentation. Um, uh, participants have been sharing uh, links and um, examples and have been sharing from their own experiences of uh, teaching STEMs to boys and girls. Um, thank you very much to all for participating. Yes, thank you very much to all. Um, so I think we, maybe we can close it now. Um, yes, of course, uh, we, we can wrap it up if uh, nobody has any, any more questions. Um, I would like again to thank everybody for participating on behalf of uh, Scientix, um, of myself and of my colleagues. Um, we hope to see you online soon for um, the next webinar in the Scientix series. Um, our next talk will be on February 10th at 6 p.m. Central European time. And uh, the next topic will be 3D printing in STEM education. I will give you the link, um, the registration link here in the chat. Um, all the information about upcoming webinars uh, can be found on the Scientix portal in the Scientix Live section. Um, please access uh, the link on the chat. Uh, thank you all very much and hope to see you again next time. Same for me. Thank you everyone for joining and uh, hope you liked it. So thank you very much.